Welcome to FM Corner. I'm Danny Kent, your host. With me today is Jason Brooks. Jason is a operator, a consultant, a speaker, uh, helping people in the hospitality industry. And Jason and I worked together at Ruby Tuesday for a few years, and I wanted to uh, sit down, talk a little bit with him today, kind of about career, uh, where he's at today, what he does, and a little bit about how that uh, plays with facility folks and people who uh, do facility work like I did for a long time. Jason, thanks so much for taking the time. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing amazing. Thank you for the invite. You know, as we were just talking, I remember you doing this like two, three years ago and you have been consistent. You have stayed on it. And it's just amazing to see this podcast grow. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, let's talk about you and talk about career. Kind of kind of walk me through, if you would, kind of where you started to where you are today. You know, like most um, restaurant lifers, you know, I took the uh, a side door in, meaning I started out washing dishes very early age, um, Sandpiper Seafood Restaurant in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And uh, that was my very first restaurant job. And since then, I have been a restaurant lifer. Now, like most restaurant tours, we have side gigs every now and then because we tend to we tend to run from leadership or management in the restaurant industry. Why? I don't know. Well, actually, there there is a few theories. If you think about the industry, and then I'll get back to my background, but if you think about our industry within the restaurant business, it is teaching an 18, 19, 20-year-old person how to run a million-dollar business on the slimmest margins in extreme temperatures at a very fast pace. So when you think of it like that, what we do to individuals is just crazy. Now, we, we aren't talking about tech to where there's a 60 per, there's a 60 percent uh profit or 70 percent or where we are talking between five and 20 percent some even less and there's a 20 year old kid that knows how to read the PL, produce profits and keep the business afloat while doing a million dollars a year it's amazing so Back to my past, you know, I really started in the back of house, you know, uh, even from washing dishes, I then went on to like prep and then on to like um, uh, the grill and then or, and actually pantry and then the grill and then saute and then eventually got into assistant kitchen manager to kitchen manager to service manager, general manager, um, area director director of operations, franchise business consultant, and franchise operations coach. I am now a owner of my own coaching, consulting, speaking firm, Hospivation, uh, like hospitality and motivation. And uh, I focus on multi-unit owners that have accelerated in growth and uh, need someone to come in to help their team in and focus on the most important things to not just goal set, but goal get. Um, I speak on stages these days. I actually just flew in last night from Albany, from actually Saratoga Springs, from doing uh, a breakout session with the Empire State Society of association executives. So all of the associations that are in the state, they come to this annual meeting. And I did one of my presentations on managing versus leading versus coaching. But our hospitality industry, what we learn from washing dishes, taking care of people, I truly believe that we are we are all hospitalitarians, which means that no matter what industry that we're in or what we do, Hospitality is at the core of who we are. Absolutely. Great point. What what drove you to want to help others in the hospitality 
industry through coaching and teaching? My silly damn mistakes. The dang mistakes that I just kept making over and over and over again. Even, Danny, even whenever I look at my past and even whenever some of your listeners look at their past. Now, I'm one of those that I've actually worked at 20, over 20 different restaurant brands. And the reason why is that I thought people were trying to change me. I thought that when I came into work at this place, this old lady or this old man, they were trying to change me to be who they were. And they weren't. All they were doing were tr- was that they were trying to show me systems. They were trying to show me systems to make me better at what I did while I could still remain myself, but I never saw it within that moment. So I was like, you know what? When it, it comes down to how I can help others, how I, 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 I can shorten time, because that is the real gift, is how do you shorten others' time to not waste it because of other similar mistakes? And that's why I wanted to start my own coaching and teaching to teach others how to create systems while still remaining who you are to where you can advance sooner in your goals. Right. And and the point that you made of who you are, and I think that is so critical. Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of like you, I started in a warehouse uh, cooking soups, you know, quiche for Ruby Tuesday and, then I was a facility guy, and then I did all the purchasing. Then I did both. I did a tour and distribution. I mean, you name it. And and my customer were the restaurant people. Mm. And I thought it was very important that, good or bad, I needed to be true and authentic to people. There's nothing, you know, if I messed up and I got called into someone's office to be talked to and so on, as long as it was authentic and it was I kind of knew what to expect. You know, you go in there, okay, you're going to, you know. I I got all that. I'm good. I'm I'm taking it and I'm good. What what I always worried about was when someone gave me a very opposite Mm -hmm. approach than what I knew their core was. In other words, totally opposite. Well, that scares Mm -hmm. me because that's not, you know, that's not what I'm comfortable with. And, And I think as a leader and as a manager, you have to be consistent and mm-hmm. and you can't fake it. People know who you are, you know? You, okay, I made a mistake. He's mad. He'll be over it in about an hour and we'll move on. Okay, well, that's kind of how it is. Well, if it turns into something totally different, now everybody gets nervous because it's out of character for people. And and that's not, you know, approving somebody handling it the wrong way. I don't mean that. I just mean consistent. You know, I worked, as did you, but I worked for Sandy Bell for 35 years. I know the drill. I know like the back of my hand. But I also knew it was consistent. Mm-hmm. And I knew, you know, it's funny. I When Ruby Tuesday was doing great, Sandy would be really hard on everybody, really hard. Mm-hmm. When things were not going well, Sandy would be very calm. That's opposite of what you normally would think. Mm -hmm. But that's how he was. When things were going well, he's pushing you to not get lazy and continue. When things were going rough, you needed him to be out there and be the face. and and To be the rock, yes. Don't don't put you further down, but try to build up. And, And so I learned that, you know, or I learned, okay, it's my turn, and I'm going to hear it for things that I need to do. I got that. Tell me. I'll work on it, you know, I and and do. And I just think when people are true, that that's huge for for you, people. You you are spot on when it comes to being true and consistency. There's there there is uh this character on Despicable Me named Kevin. Kevin is one of the little yellow people with the overalls. And in one of the movies, he gets stuck with this evil serum and he is stuck in his arm and he turns into like half good, half evil Kevin, like he's half yellow, half purple. 
And when it comes down to being consistent, I always think of Kevin from Despicable Me, that some weeks Kevin comes in, he's like, hey, great job. Yeah, good job. Da, 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 da. You guys are on fire. Keep it going. And then like two days later, Kevin comes in. Everyone else has been the same all week, but Kevin, he's changed. Kevin is now evil, Kevin. And whenever you say create that consistency, yes, there is the ebb and flow of the business, but whenever you ebb and flow your personality day to day, hour to hour, that creates a negative environment within your business. It does. It doesn't matter what business that you run. When you are inconsistent with your approach, it is bad for the brand, for the customers, and for your employees. It creates this environment that does not move the business forward. But like you said, knowing Sandy, knowing that when the business was doing well and when the business wasn't doing well, that's still consistent because you knew what to expect. That is still consistent. But when it's just the flip of a hat and someone's just mad when, when, whenever they come in, that creates chaos. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. What's your biggest lesson you've learned in hospitality? Oh, can't do it by yourself. You cannot do it by yourself. There's so many times that a lot of managers come in and um, they think that the harder I work, the more I do, the better that it's going to get. You know, you can think about that a few different ways, but there's times that every single manager was scheduled in at 8 a.m. And because of all the things that they had to do, they said, well, I'm going to come in at 7 or then I'll come in at 6 or 5.30. And then they were scheduled to leave at 6 p.m. Like, well, I'll stay till 8. I'll stay till 9. I'll, I'll stay till 9.30 because they were trying to get every single thing done by themselves. And they would still, even when, when coming in earlier and leaving later, only get 80% of the items done, even if that. And that to me is the biggest lesson is that you can't do it by yourself. In our industry, you have to learn how to delegate one and two, build a team. Build a team A around you that owns your department, that owns your building, that owns your level, but you have to have a team as a manager doing it with you versus trying to do it by yourself. Great point. And and I think I give a, a lesson learned on my end. And and when I, when I started at Ruby Tuesday, I think we had six restaurants. And then and then when I took over facilities and purchasing, we started growing. And then when the Morrison piece came in, we really started growing, you know, right. and we were doing 50 a year. Suddenly I got 100. Now I got 200. Now I got 300. Now I got 500, you know, and the old program had piece of paper, write everything down. Da, da. This is bigger than me. This is much bigger than me. And and I had a team and I had a very good team, I had a very diverse team that most of them had never been in facilities because that's what I wanted. I wanted to build and train and teach. But making that change from doing it all and trying to do it all to learning to delegate and trust your team is the most difficult thing you do. And I, I can remember when you were in some of these, all the areas would come in, area directors and regionals would come into the office and be there for two or three days doing all the stuff. And I'd do a spill. And as I walked out of the room at the very end, I, I would make a joke and say, I'm the best facility manager you ever had. Now, I'm the only one everybody ever had because I've been there longer than anybody else. But, you know, I didn't let, leave that part out. But But I would say... At the end of the day, if you're absolutely got one person you got to call no matter what, you call me. You call me. And so one of the guys who worked for me, we get back to my office one day and he goes, you got a minute? I said, sure. He said, comes in my office, shuts the door. He goes off the record. I'm like, sure, whatever you want. And he said, do you know who you are? You know, I'm making a joke of it. I look at and find that business card sitting on my desk and pick it up and go, I'm I'm not sure, but it said Danny Kings. And and 
he's like, no, do you know who you are? I'm like, I'm just reading you what the card says. That's what's the, where are we going? He goes, you're Danny Blankenkinch, this way he says. I'll leave that word out. I said, okay. He said, when you walk out of that room and you tell everybody, if you absolutely got to make one call, you call me. How does the rest of your team ever get the opportunity to learn how to become you? Mm. And it stunned me, literally Mm. stunned me. He said, we're never going to get that opportunity. You can say it, just change it. And I was like, I don't want to put some of those situations on you guys, so I'd rather it be me. And he goes, I understand all the reasons why. However, we won't learn and we unless we have opportunity. And, and he goes, are you mad? I'm, not, I'm not mad at all. I'm stunned because you're right. You're right. And I get it. And and I changed it, Jason. And, and I said, if you need somebody, you call myself or my team. Mm-hmm. You, anybody on my team will be glad to help you. And if they need help, they'll call me. Yep. And and changed it to give them opportunity. And and it was a learning point for me because it I couldn't do it all. I knew that. I didn't mean it that way. I was a huge protector of my team and wanted them to be successful because you're an operator working in North Carolina. Whoever your assigned facility person is on my team, I want you calling them. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk to you, but I can't every day. I want them to be able to do what you need. And then if it's something big, okay, then I'll be, I mean, you know, because you're an air director and there are 50 more. And 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 so my tendency would be to try to protect, and that was not that that was not a good way. And so you learn, you know, to to do that, and and that was a very telling point for me. What I thought and I spoke about in time was how proud I am of the fact that one of my team would come in here and go, "Okay, Chief, off the record, here we go." You're you're not doing this right. I mean, most people won't that's do that. Impressive. That, most, that's impressive. That's impressive. Most people won't do that, you know. No. But he did, and it was a learning lesson. So so you're to your point, you cannot do it by yourself and you have to delegate, but you also have to give some responsibility and let people let people do the same thing I did, fall down and get back up, you know. Because you're gonna it's figure- funny. It, it, it's funny that your story is so similar to everyone listening. They can all think of that moment of, man, I, I really thought I was doing my team a favor by protecting them. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, the more we think that we are protecting them, the more we are keeping them from growth, which means that we're actually damaging them. Because we would love to think that everyone works one place for the rest of their life. They only need to be under my wing and that's it. But at some point, especially these days, they leave to go elsewhere and they're either leaving to go elsewhere armed with some great information, with some wonderful teachings, with some real life things that they went through under your wing and learned, or we we uh, shielded them from the real work world all this time. And now when they get somewhere else, they're failing. So we have two choices. Either A, teach them everything we know, put them not into harm's way, but, 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 Put them with you on the side, watching what harm's way looks like. Let them get that experience, make those connections, get the learnings, get some of that delegation, have some of that power to make choices and and understand what making choices in a work environment is. And then now, now you have really helped them to either be a better teacher, a better astronaut, a better dentist, a better facilities manager. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have helped them grow. Sure. And, and the key that is, and, and I said this many times, 
we're gonna we're in facilities, okay? Our life is problems, right? And we're gonna lose, and we're gonna lose some days badly. However, there's gonna be that call from that manager or director that goes, "Boy, thank you." Yep, good looking out. And and for everyone that does that, the other nine are telling you, "Hey, Danny, you're not fast enough, quick enough." Cheap enough, whatever. You know, I mean, that's just the way of the world. It's what you do. But if you have problems and you want to come and talk to me about it, I'm all ears. Bring something with you. Bring an idea how to fix it. Because I'm not going to tell you how to fix it. We're going to talk through it. So having the issue, no problem. Bring it on. But first question I'm going to ask you every time is, what do you think we should do? You know? It's you're not moving it. We're doing it together. Yep. That's a big part. There's a, who's been your mentors? You know, in my earlier days, um, very first corporate management role was with a full casual brand in Fayetteville, large brand. And the GM there, his name was Mark Himes. Oh, man. Mark Himes was my silent mentor. Okay, you have silent mentors and then you have formal ones. And then you may even have your own imaginary board of directors. But my silent mentor was was uh, Mark Himes and Mark Himes was the absolute mayor of 4000 square feet. He knew he knew the building. He knew the people. He knew the customers the new ones from the regulars. He knew the team. He knew everyone at the corporate office. And he, I mean, he just owned that 4,000 square feet. And I watched him like a hawk picking up on tips because truly that's where the real power of influence is. It isn't actually whenever you say, watch me do this. And then people are watching you. The real influence that, that they typically pick up on is whenever you think that they aren't watching you. That's whenever you're leaving the biggest impression. And he left a true impression that I still call him one of my silent mentors. One of my formal ones is a person that you and I know both very well. Chef Pat, Pat Peterson. Pat Peterson is just an amazing man, an amazing mentor. We still talk. Up to this day, uh, he has helped coached me for many years from Ruby Tuesday's days all the way up to this year. We still have great conversations on what I should be doing next and then how I should be doing it and then just on life in general. But Pat Peterson, he is amazing. And then finally, my imaginary board of directors, that's going to, you know, Every person, whether you have your own business or you don't, or you're, you're, you just have your own personal brand of just who you are, you should all have your own imaginary board of directors. Mine's is Steve Jobs, Mahatma Gandhi, Henry Ford, uh, Coco Chanel, Dr. Martin Luther King, and Deepak Chopra. They are on my imaginary board of directors to help me think about how can I be a bit more imaginative? How can I be a bit more distinct? How can I be grounded? Um, but but yeah, that's my mentors and my board of directors. That is a great answer. That's a term, imaginary board of directors. I haven't heard that is great. I and and when you mentioned Pat Peterson, I actually talked to Pat two days ago. <laughs> I am I am I am helping him with some third party CMMS uh companies mm -hmm. to look at uh and and also trying to assist with um people in the industry that I know that are construction facility folks are looking for someone to add to help get Pat out of all that. And that is funny, one of the most upbeat human beings, positive all the time and so on individuals that I've ever met in my life. And I've been gone from Ruby Tuesday for 11 years. Pat's been gone probably about the same time, maybe a little shorter. And like I said, we still talk. He's like, hey, I need some help. And if it was going the other side of the coin, I'd be calling him going, hey, I need a little help. And and that means everything. That is, that is awesome 
that that you mentioned Pat Peterson. So it's funny, you know, I was talking to Gene Davis earlier this week at Miss Sandino Farms and Gene, former director, obviously in Philly for Ruby's for years. And I asked him the same question. He mentioned Gina Chavri, who I know very well, and Bob Baldini. And I said, <laughs> Bob Baldini was the greatest, calmest talker, teacher person I ever met in my life. Mm. I could spend time with Bob and ask questions, and Bob would just thoughtfully listen and give me options and opinions and ask questions and probe me. And it just almost flatline. I mean, never, you know. And I walked out of there going, holy cow. Wow. You know, it wasn't the answer. Here's the answer. Go do this. It was, mm -hmm. let's talk about this. And where are you in it? And it's amazing. And when Gene said, I was like, you're, you're exactly right. One of the best teachers of how to, you know, succeed in this industry and do things was Bob. But it's outstanding you mentioned Pat. I think that's great. Uh, let's talk about what, how does a good facility team help you when you're in operations? Well, first, a great facilities team helps my team to focus on the two most important things, the food and the people. I, I, I do say the, the food because of food safety, sure. the food safety aspect. If we don't have food safety first, we don't have any people. The people are important but they help us as operators stick to and trust the system. When everything is working as it should, we can focus on making great food, making it at the best times and getting it to the people as they need it. Whenever we don't have a great facilities person working alongside us. It makes it more challenging because then we question, we question and we second guess all of the levels before it gets to the people. So that's, that's, uh, that's one way how they help us. They, they help us to trust the recipe that the recipe and a recipe is just ingredients. The recipe also includes HACCP all of the critical control points within that recipe of what we're making that dish to in order to make sure it's getting out to, to the guest uh, safely. And then of course, back to the systems, whether it is the uh, system of when we turn on all of the equipment, not all at the same time, but staggering it. Um, whenever we want to trust how to clean something, but all the systems, we can safely say without having to second guess it and just do it because that's the way you should do it. It helps us to stick to the system. Lastly, it helps a great facilities team, helps operations understand what a true emergency is. Because there's lots of times that we make calls for non-emergencies, but we call them in emergency. But when you have a great facilities team working with you, you truly understand what a real emergency is because there is that open communication back and forth on what's going on. And we then understand as operators, what is truly a 911. That's a great answer. I, I, I think from the facility side in working with operations teams, I think it's critically important. One, you want to build trust. You know, if you call me and say, Dan, I got a problem, and it's this, and I go, Jason, I got it. When you hang the phone up, you're done. He got it. And I trust he's going to do everything he can to fix it. And if he can't, he's going to call and tell me. I'm not going to be left hanging because you don't fix everything. It's impossible. But he, when he says, I'm on it, or I got it, okay, I'm good. And, and I'm going back to running my restaurant and so on. I think trust. I think I, I always taught my team to under-promise and over-deliver. Are you going to have it done tomorrow? No. It's going to be Friday. And today's Monday. 
but I'll be done and I'll have it resolved by the end of the week and it'll be fixed Friday. And then I'm going to call you on Thursday and tell you it's done. Because in your mind, you're waiting for Friday. And if I tell you, if I call you on Thursday and tell you done, which might be my original day to begin with, holy cow, that's better. That's better. Nothing's worse than you saying, hey, Danny, you're going to be done Wednesday, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then not. Because I'm just appeasing you to give you the answer that you want, not the real answer, you know. No, that that's not good. And then I think it's important to tell people the why. You know, why can't I have a new fryer? Well, there's only two years left on your lease. We're down in sales this year. And until we get a lease extension, I can't put a new fryer in the, into the restaurant. So for now, we're going to do the repair. If the extension gets done and completed, then we'll have another conversation. We'll talk about buying a new fryer. That's better than just saying no because I said so. That doesn't make any sense. Mm-mm. You got to tell people the why. So I think it's trust. It's, you know, don't promise things you can't deliver. Or you think you can, you hang the phone up and go, how am I going to do that? Well, you're already mm-hmm. in trouble. And and then third is give people the why. Explain the reasoning behind your decisions. They may not agree. Many times they don't agree. That's okay. You have a job to do. You know, do your job and 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 get people to trust you that what you're doing is for their best interest and yours and the company, everybody. <laughs>